Hi everyone, chapter 18 is going to cover diseases of the skin and internal tissues. So we'll be talking about the general classifications of skin infections and some pathogens associated with those skin infections. We'll also discuss pathogens associated with infections of internal tissues and we'll talk about routes of transmission. So in this chapter, as I said, we're gonna be talking about skin and internal tissues. And closing a wound isn't just placing a couple stitches and making sure that the skin edges are together. It also um, has to do with how we put together the underlying tissues, the deep tissues. Let's say we're doing a breast biopsy and we take out um, a, a, a a mass of adipose tissue for testing, then we have to make sure that we close that in a way that it reduces the dead space. Because if there's just an open space in the deep tissues, that is gonna um, be a reservoir for fluid to collect and it's gonna create a seroma. And in there, that is the perfect place for bacteria to kind of live and collect and proliferate. Uh, and aside from that, we're not gonna get good healing. So um, that's why it's important for us to understand um, wound closure and uh, you know different microbes that can impact the healing of the skin and the deeper tissues and um, you know that that the the tissues are handled properly and that they're closed properly to promote the best healing possible. As we have discussed previously in our anatomy class, the skin is the biggest organ of our bodies and it is our body's first line of defense. It's composed of two layers. The outermost layer that we can touch and see is the epidermis, and deep to that is the dermis. And the dermis has a lot of structures in there. If you look at this picture, there are arteries and veins and nerves and hair follicles and uh, sweat glands and oil glands sensory receptors, all kinds of fun stuff. And at the very bottom of the dermis is what we call the subcutaneous layer. And that subcutaneous layer is what glues the skin to the underlying adipose. And uh, we also know that the skin is covered with bacteria. For every cell of our body, there are 10 bacteria. And having an understanding of these bacteria, what they do, how they work, and what opportunities they take is going to help us as surgical techs be better at preventing surgical site infections. There are two overarching categories for the bacteria that is on our skin. And the first overarching category is the resident microbes or the indigenous flora, sometimes um, referred to as the normal microflora. And this is the stuff, <laughs> the microbes that live on our skin all the time. And then we have other microbes that are referred to as transient microbes. And those are the ones that we pick up from our environment. And when um, we perform a skin prep prior to surgery, what we're hoping to do is remove all the transient microorganisms and also reduce resident flora as well. Resident flora such as Staphylococcus, and uh, corini bacteria, micrococci, bacillus, gram-negative and gram-positive uh, microorganisms. And, uh, you know, they're not all bad. They help us out a lot, actually. Scientists suspect that the, all of the bacteria that lives on our skin helps to crowd out the other more pathogenic species. And by taking up space uh, on our skin, that inhibits these other uh, 
uh, more pathogenic bacteria from then taking up shop um, on our skin and in our pores and those kinds of things. But when there is a breach in our skin, then that allows these bacteria that typically protect us from other more pathogenic species to then invade the tissues and potentially get into the lymphatic system and into the circulatory system where they are carried to other organs or cause septicemia or whatever the case may be. So staphylococcal infections are the most common skin pathogens and they're responsible for fun things like boils, abscesses, and superficial folliculitis. You can see some of those images here uh, in that top, uh, top little image there on your screen. Now Staph aureus is pretty much the most pathogenic of the staphylococci. It's easily transmitted by patients, employees, and visitors, and there are those antibiotic resistant strains that we have to also be aware of. Now, Staph aureus colonizes in the nasal passages, and it can also be spread through droplet contamination with a sneeze, um, for example. It can attach to hair follicles, therefore causing the folliculitis. And um, it can also attach to eyelashes. And if it gets into a follicle of our eyelash, it can lead to a sty. Um, sometimes um, these, um, this folliculitis can lead to something called a furuncle and those need to be incised and washed and drained. And uh, they can also um, cause something called ichthema. Now, streptococcal infections, pretty much um, strep pyogenes is gonna be our biggest offender here. And strep, remember, causes necrotizing fasciitis or the flesh eating disease, and so it's referred to as the flesh-eating bacteria. It can cause impetigo. It can also cause erysipelas, and uh, typically infections of the skin are localized, but if it infiltrates the deeper tissues, that's where we can get the necrotizing fasciitis, and this can lead to uh, debridements or perhaps even an amputation. Uh, these guys also produce um, a hemolysin, the streptococcal bacteria that can break down red blood cells, and an enzyme, if you remember we talked about earlier, um, hyaluronidase and uh, um, uh, hyaluronic acid is the substance that kind of helps our tissue stick together. And this bacteria has the ability of breaking down those connections. And that's how it infiltrates the deeper tissues. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is not an unfamiliar bacteria to us. We've talked about it a couple times already. Um, this bacteria likes to live in water that is uh, not sufficiently chlorinated, like pools and hot tubs, so much so that the EPA has set strict guidelines for these public hot tubs and whirlpools because there was this um, uh, spike in folliculitis cases being reported. It can also cause dermatitis. Um, however, where we are worried about this the most is with our burn victims. They are the ones that are more susceptible of developing these severe infections due to pseudomonas because uh, when you have a burn, that pretty much burns off your first line of defense. It completely eliminates that. And so um, uh, what we need to do is try to eliminate 
uh, as many of the bacteria as possible. We bring them to the operating room to do debridements uh, in an effort to control that infection. And interestingly, they can even survive in some disinfectants. And more and more species of Pseudomonas are becoming antibiotic resistant, and that is a real concern. Hackney is characterized by inflammatory pustules, cysts, and papules, and a couple of the pathogens responsible are Propionibacterium acnes, and our Staph aureus, and our Carinibacteriums. What happens is the uh, channels become blocked in the skin that are designed for the oil, the sebum, to get to the outside of the body. And so the Propionibacterium metabolizes this sebum and that leads to inflammation. And then that leads to fluid accumulating and that creates a cyst that can rupture and lead to scarring. Acne vulgaris is a serious form that is caused by the P. acnes. And uh, topical creams, uh, oral antibiotics are, are sometimes used to treat this uh, situation. Hansen's disease we already talked about before. It is known as leprosy. Remember, it's caused by Mycobacterium leprae. There are two different types, neural and tuberculoid, and they result in erythematosus, and um, this causes lesions on the skin that can become disfiguring, Remember, we saw the lion face where it can erode cartilage and um, bone uh, of the, the orbital bones as well. So we've talked about Bacillus anthracis and Clostridium perfringens previously, but just as a review, Bacillus anthracis can cause cutaneous anthrax, which is the least dangerous form and it is the most common and the way that it is transmitted is by a break in the skin and then that can cause small little bumps or blisters uh, a day to two months after exposure and uh, with proper treatment uh, it will heal and life will go on Without treatment, approximately 20% of these cases can become fatal. Now, gas gangrene, again, caused by Clostridium perfringens, but can also be caused by strep, strep and staph and a vibrio, but those that have diabetes and atherosclerosis are at a higher risk. And this is going to cause uh, swelling and emphysema underneath the skin. And we need to treat with antibiotics or do surgical debridements and or amputations to be able to save the individual's life. Fungi can cause three different types of infections, cutaneous, subcutaneous, and systemic, with systemic being the most serious and cutaneous being the least serious. One of the more common cutaneous mycoses is called ringworm. And uh, it's named for that because it causes this characteristic red ring, as you can see in the top image there. It can also get into the hair follicles and cause the hair to break off, and then that the infected area could appear bald because of that. Um, and then there's other types of cutaneous mycoses that are pretty much named for wherever they occur in the body, like tinea pettis, which is athlete's foot, Tinea curis, which is um, jock itch and affects the groin. Tinea corporis, which affects the body. And tinea barbe, which affects the beard area. There is also fungus that can um, infect the nails, and that's called tinea unguium. Typically, these fungal infections of the nails are secondary to an infection somewhere else. Collectively, all together, we refer to these as dermatomycoses. 
They can be readily passed from one individual to another through direct contact or indirectly through shower stalls. That's why if you're using a public shower, it's good to wear flip flops or something like that. Some common pathogens responsible for dermatomycosis or microsporum, epidermophyton and trichophyton. And typically these are treated with topical medications that are antifungal. Subcutaneous mycoses are more serious because they, uh, the, the fungi can infiltrate the skin into the deeper tissues. And uh, typically these are caused by sporothrix schenkii. These, uh, this is common in individuals that do a lot of gardening, but maybe they don't wear gloves to protect their hands. And if they have an opening or a cut on their skin, then the fungus can get in there. It can penetrate into the deeper tissue and can potentially get into the circulatory system or the lymphatic system and travel to other areas of the body. Candida albicans is a common one that um, we've talked about before. And it is a, uh, it's a commensal in the mouth. And, uh, you know, those that are immunocompromised or pregnant females are more susceptible to getting infections by subcutaneous mycoses like Candida albicans. And then lastly, systemic mycoses. These are the most serious, as I said, and the way that an individual can, um, can get an infection is by inhaling the spores of these fungi that get stirred up in the soil, in the dirt, and they can go into the lungs, and if the body doesn't fight it off, they can eventually enter the circulatory system or lymphatic system and uh, travel to other areas of the body. We've talked about some viral skin infections already way back in chapter eight. We talked about how viral diseases of the skin can include um, minor uh, diseases such as warts or major such as smallpox. There are about 50 types of papilloma of virus that cause warts or papillomas and typically those can be removed easily in the doctor's office with some liquid nitrogen. Chicken pox we're familiar with as well. It is caused by the varicella zoster virus and these cause little raised um, fluid filled, very itchy little spots on the skin. Uh, typically it's mild but it can progress to encephalitis or pneumonia in some individuals, typically those with lower immune systems. Now, chicken pox can invade the peripheral nervous system and lay dormant in the body for a long period of time. And in situations of stress or a compromised immune system, it can rear its ugly head again. And that we call shingles. It's typically localized and on one side of the body and it will present itself as kind of a ring or a band, which is how it gets its name actually. Um, shingles comes from a Latin word meaning belt or girdle, and zoster is Greek for the word belt. So typically this is going to occur on one side of the body, the chest, an extremity, forehead, scalp. And really the way we treat this is, uh, in addition to an antiviral type of medication, is really treating the symptoms and helping the individual to stay comfortable until the situation resolves itself. You may have seen individuals with this characteristic scar in the image on the bottom right of your screen, and this is from a smallpox vaccination. It's given a little bit differently than a regular vaccination. 
where we use a hypodermic needle. This uses a bifurcated needle and it's dipped into the virus, a live uh, culture of the virus, and then the skin is pricked several times over. Uh, we don't routinely give this vaccination anymore because the smallpox virus has been eradicated. So uh, unfortunately, this can cause a complication if for some reason it started to um, spread again. However, the uh, CDC promises us that there is enough vaccine in the United States for everyone that lives here. Uh, but nevertheless, smallpox is caused by the variola virus. And there are two different types, major and minor. Now, the mortality rate for variola major is pretty high, 30%, while the minor variety is less than 1%. And there's four types of the major variola, which include ordinary, modified, flat, and hemorrhagic, with flat and hemorrhagic being quite rare, but the most dangerous. 90% of the major uh, type of cases um, are uh, from the uh, ordinary type of variola major. Transmission occurs through aerosol drops that can be sneezed out or coughed out and by the infected individual and then breathed in by somebody else. And these lesions are the most characteristic signs. However, they do not appear first. So the smallpox virus can invade a variety of other organs before it ever shows up on the skin. The um, the, the vaccination does pose some sort of risk because when the vaccination is given, then there's these lesions are going to form that have the live virus in them and they can burst and leak and it could potentially spread the virus to other parts of the body if it's not cared for correctly. Uh, but it's very rare and very infrequent. Out of 1 million persons vaccinated in the past, it's estimated that 14 to 52 of them actually suffered from devastating reactions due to the vaccine. In a past lecture, we talked about vectors and how they can transmit parasites and viruses to us through their bites. And um, the vectors that are most commonly responsible for transmitting these diseases are ticks, mosquitoes, lice, mites, flea spiders, and flies. And they're typically unaffected by whatever parasite or virus they're carrying around. And then when they bite us, we get it. Now there's a couple different types of reactions that can occur. One, nothing may be seen at the, um, the area of the bite, but it infiltrates the deeper tissues, can get into the circulatory system and the, the lymphatic system, can cause some sort of systemic um, disease. Uh, otherwise, it could be very localized at the bite. Some species uh, that are really common for transmitting these diseases are from the family Rickettsiaceae, and that in, uh, would include typhus, scrub typhus, Q fever, and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Okay, so we're coming into the home stretch here. The last thing that we have to talk about is infections of internal tissues. Internal tissues such as breasts, fascia, tendon sheaths, bones, joints, and lymph nodes are all susceptible to infections by many of the pathogens that we have already talked about. 
And uh, aside from being localized, they these pathogens have the ability to penetrate the skin and get into the internal tissues that are typically tissues that are bacteria free. So let's start by talking about breast tissue infections. Typically, breast tissue infections are categorized as lactational infections or lactational mastitis and non-lactational mastitis. Lactational mastitis occurs when a woman is breastfeeding and there becomes some breach in the skin. Typically, it um, occurs because of the baby breastfeeding, irritates the nipple, and it can cause a breach in the skin or a crack in the skin near and uh, on the nipple. And this um, allows the bacteria from the baby's mouth to uh, penetrate the skin and get into the deeper tissues. The bacteria have this perfect environment because the milk offers some really nutritious food, nutritional food for them to grow and proliferate. Oftentimes the breast becomes firm and reddened and swollen as you can see in this top um, leftmost picture on your screen. Uh, it can also uh, lead to an abscess that could require surgical incision and drainage. Otherwise, it's suggested uh, that we use a warm compress, massage, and antibiotics to treat that. Um, Staph aureus is typically the most common culprit here. And in the nursery, if healthcare workers aren't careful, they can cross contaminate infants with Staph aureus or with MRSA, and that can be um, uh, lead to serious complications for mom and baby. Chronic types of areolar abscesses are typically due to the blockage of sebaceous glands. Remember, those live at the base of the hair follicle, and their job is to produce sebum, which is that lubricating oil for the hair, right? So um, if those become blocked, then uh, the area can become painful and reddened and edematous or swollen. Non-lactational mastitis typically occurs because some sort of surgery has taken place, most commonly. Um, if an individual has had a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, and then to add insult to injury, they're having chemo and radiation, this is going to lower their immune system. It's also going to seriously uh, impact the, the health of the tissue where it's being radiated. So that can all lead to an increased chance of infection in non-lactating um, females. Fasciitis, remember fascia is that tough, fibrous connective tissue that um, holds the muscles together uh, can also become infected with various types of pathogens. Um, we've already talked about necrotizing fasciitis and uh, typically uh, these are strep infections that can begin as uh, cellulitis and can spread to superficial and then uh, infiltrate the deeper layers into the fascia. Bacterial tendinitis is something else that can occur and we don't want to confuse it with um, uh, tendinitis, regular tendinitis, which occurs because of um, repetitive movements that the that the fingers are doing, let's say. Um, the tendon sheath is where this typically occurs. And the tendon sheath is like, um, if you can think of a straw that's in its wrapping, the straw would represent the tendon and the paper covering of the straw would represent the sheath. 
and the tendon slides back and forth in this sheath. So you could see how repetitive movements could cause inflammation of it. However, if bacteria is introduced into there because of some sort of penetrating injury or whatever, then um, an infection of that sheath can occur and the infection can move along that sheath because it makes like this perfect little tube-like pathway. And we refer to that as tenosynovitis. Uh, uh, tenosynovitis is going to present itself with pain on extension, tenderness, redness, inflammation, those kinds of things. And in some instances, fever may be present as well. Now let's talk a little bit about lymphadenitis. Lymphadenitis has to do with the enlargement and or inflammation of the lymph nodes. And this typically signifies that there's an infection or some sort of weirdness going on either locally or generally in the body. It could impact a single node or it could impact several nodes. Take a, uh, a peek at this picture on the top right of your screen. That is an example of lymphadenitis of the axilla. Okay, there's a, a bunch of nodes uh, that live in the axillary region and uh, you can see that these are large and inflamed there. Uh, generalized lymph node enlargement is common in mononucleosis with an infection due to the cytomegalovirus, bruce, uh, brucellosis, secondary syphilis, and disseminated histoplasmosis, strep, TB, uh, and genital herpes simplex can also result in the same thing. Now, lymphadenitis can be acute, subacute, or chronic. Uh, however, uh, at any rate, it is due to those cells of the immune system. They know something's going on, and so they're multiplying really rapidly, and that can lead to that inflammation. Um, other viruses and fungi can also cause lymphadenitis. Sometimes this results in abscesses that would need to be incised and drained or some of the nodes uh, removed altogether. Lymphangitis, we've talked about before, is the inflammation of the vessels that carry the lymph from node to node to node. And that is a sign that those pathogens that have uh, infiltrated the node are now on their way to other parts of the body and the circulatory system. And then this can cause a systemic uh, infection as well. Um, characteristic of this is uh, red streaks that are seen running up and down the length of the extremity. Lastly, osteomyelitis, well not lastly because we're going to quickly touch on arthritis, but Osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone. Now take a look at this bottom right image here. Now this is, uh, we're looking at the, the foot is at the most distal end of this image and we have the tibia and the fibula there. And this is a bone that is infected. And because of that, what they do sometimes is they will take that bone cement that we use when we're doing like joint arthroplasties and gluing in those implants will actually mix up, and this is the surge text responsibility, um, take the powder part of the cement and they're going to put a bunch of powdered antibiotic into it, will be delivered to the field, and then that'll be mixed with the powder, the liquid part gets mixed in, and the, you'll oftentimes have like a wire, and either you or the surgeon or both of you together are going to make some little beads out of the cement and put them along the wire. And so that's what you're seeing here. Those little red discs are loaded on a wire and they're going to allow them to harden. And once they're hardened, they're gonna put them in the wound. And uh, the, the, um, the premise behind this is that those antibiotics are going to leach out of the cement and into the surrounding tissue. And so we have direct um, uh, antibiotic therapy uh, that we can do. 
Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing that we'll definitely do in surgery. Now there's two different types of osteomyelitis, either acute or chronic. Acute is most often due from the invasion of bugs that live on the skin like staph or um, strep. Uh, hemophilus can also be a culprit. Typically, acute osteomyelitis is going to occur at the epiphyseal plates of the long bones. Remember, that's the area where the bones are growing from. It's kind of this little gap in the bone. And uh, that's due because there's uh, decreased blood flow at the site. And um, so bacteria uh, has a good chance uh, to flourish there. Chronic osteomyelitis can be caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and is typically a secondary infection arising from a primary infection, uh, most often due to salmonella or pseudomonas. Also, treponema can be a culprit. Uh, in individuals with chronic osteomyelitis, it can also affect the vertebrae as well as the, the bones of the hands, feet, hips, and knees. And lastly, but not least, arthritis. Arthritis is an inflammation of the joints and it is painful. Typically there is swelling and maybe difficulty moving at the joint. There's two types, osteo arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Now, osteoarthritis typically occurs due to the aging process. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. And what happens is antibodies um, are produced by the body that uh, attack the body's own cells and its tissues. So this is an overactive inflammatory response. And a lot of times these individuals with rheumatoid, they'll have very deformed and disfigured joints. Uh, we see it in the fingers a lot and we can do uh, joint replacements of the fingers to help out with that. Septic arthritis can also occur and that is a result of some sort of bacteria getting into the joint from the bloodstream. So there's some sort of bacteremia and it has now entered the joint. Could also be due to some sort of penetrating trauma. Once again, Staph aureus is the most common culprit, but that Haemophilus influenzae and Salmonella can also um, be a causative agent. And then lastly, Neisseria gonorrhoeae can affect many joints as well, and that is referred to as polyarthritis. That about sums it up. In closing, I would just like to talk for a moment about how many skin cells are shed each day from our skin. About 500 million skin cells each day. And this comes into play because we know all of the bacteria that lives on our skin. And when we shed these skin cells, that bacteria is still present on those dead skin cells. So from a surge tech perspective, when we are opening our sterile field, it is a best practice to wear a long sleeved cover jacket. And that's why you receive one with your uniform. This is best practice because it helps prevent those dead skin cells from falling onto your back table. And that is an essential component of making sure that we are keeping our fields sterile and free of any type of microorganisms. So that's gonna wrap up this lecture regarding diseases of the skin and internal tissues.